that's the way it got started. Okay. You know, first of all, there wasn't really that much television. It was in the early 50s. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, you used to watch television in the window of an appliance store. There'd be 35 sets all on the same channel. Right. And they'd have a speaker. And if you didn't like the show, you had to change the store, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Tokyo tonight. I don't, oh, there I am. There I you are. I tell you that that way that you hand wrote my name is just the way I wish I could write <laughs> by hand. I went to a handwriting. I didn't go to a handwriting analyst once. I happened to be in the presence of one. And mm -hmm. she looked at my, this was many years ago. And she looked at my handwriting and went pale. And I said, <laughs> what? He said, you'd rather not know. So. Yeah. <laughs> I, and I do have the worst handwriting, and that handwriting is what I have always wanted. Is that uh, electronic? Please? Yeah, yeah, it's electronic. electronic. It's a program. I um, actually I... studied calligraphy. Oh. Wow. I mean, I would spend hours making the letter A and the letter, and it was very, it was fun. I would put on great music, and I had this <laughs> lined paper, and I would just do it, and it was marvelous. Wow. Until I tried to do it, and, and it all. <laughs> a friend of mine asked me to do a menu for a buffet. <laughs> he was, <doing. laughs> and you know the thing about it is, if you're fine all the way down, and then if you do something on the last thing, and that was the most stressful experience. Wow. Yeah, it's it's really hard. I mean, my my teacher used to be able to used to grade our papers in calligraphy, and sometimes we'd look at it and we'd be like. Okay, none of us can read this, but it's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> like, I got beautiful it, next, but it's so beautifully. Yeah, yeah. Done. I'm glad. <laughs> yeah. So I just want to, I mean, I, I would love to know if, if comedy writing and uh, what you've been doing for the majority of your life was something that you wanted to start out with when you were younger. How did you even fall into it? Well, the only thing I knew about what I wanted was to not be in my father's business. My mm. father owned an auction gallery on the boardwalk in Atlantic City. Okay. And I used to have to work there during the summer and I, I just hated it. Right. And I really, I really had no aspirations. Uh, it kind of just happened. Uh, I, well, what really happened was that uh, when I got out of college, I got a, a job from an ad in, uh, the New York Times for the WNEW radio, which back in the fifties was one of the really, it was like the premier radio station in the country. They had all the greatest disc jockeys. I mean, radio today is, is so different than that, but I mean, right. they, they had shows like the make believe ballroom that <laughs> was run by William B. Williams, who was the guy who named, Frank Sinatra, the chairman of the board, mm. and they had the Milkman's Matinee, which was on all. I mean, it was just an incredible place. And I saw an ad for they were looking for a uh, assistant in the continuity department for thirty five dollars a week. <laughs> and I had no idea what the continuity department was, but I figured at thirty five dollars a week, it probably didn't require a master's degree. <laughs> And I went to the interview and this guy talked for a while and he said, okay, I'm going out to lunch. I want you to write a jingle mm -hmm. and a commercial and a weather report. <laughs> and he walked out the door <laughs> and I said, oh my God, what am I going to call? I called my best friend. I said, I'm in this office and I, I don't know what I'm, he said, well, just do it. So I did. And, he came back and it was passable and he hired me for $35 a week. 
And then he got a phone call from the guy he had had lunch with, which was a job interview for him. Oh, wow. And I ended up the head of the continuity department. Wow. Day <laughs> and still didn't know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> and what it was was not a, a big deal. And you know, it was about every show had a book, do a commercial here, here's the copy here, mm -hmm. and had to put the book together again. It was, it was just right. the dullest thing. And then I had to hire an assistant. So I, in, I interviewed a number of guys, and I met Sam Denoff. He came in. Wow. He had just lost the job as the bargain broadcaster at Klein's department store. Mm. But that job consisted of getting on and say, attention shoppers. <laughs> we have received a truckload of sneakers. from." And he once said, attention shoppers. We have just received a shipment of maiden form bras and we're having a bust out sale so they fired him wow for that and i hired him and uh, <laughs> i had started to write little jokes on the, the pages that i was putting because it was so dull mm -hmm. you know so if it was a a commercial for seat covers i'd make a little seat cover joke right and so he continued with me to do that. And the disc jockeys were reading them. And the head of the station said, uh, that's fun. Uh, that's good. You do that. And then they, we had a Christmas party. And Sam and I did uh, a uh, show in the Christmas party. And this little guy came up afterwards and he said, Hi, I'd like to be your agent. Wow. Nobody had ever said that. I never, we never even thought. I mean, we had been writing, we we wrote material for comedy teams that will never be heard of. I mean, <laughs> we wanted to be Martin and Lewis, and none of them were. And uh, <laughs> but we wrote for some guys and and we started to get a little bit of a reputation. And then he said, I want to be a rage. I said, great. You have a card. He said, no, not yet. I till today I was in the mail room and I, I don't have my cards yet. <laughs> well, even without your card. And it turned out my hair is tough. That guy was George Shapiro. Oh and my I, God. Yeah, George Shapiro, who is not only one of the sweetest, most wonderful people in the world, I've but heard. probably the best manager that there is in the business. I mean, he discovered uh, Jerry Seinfeld, Seinfeld yeah. and, and Andy Kaufman yep. and uh, countless people. And he was our original agent. Wow. And we were his first clients. And uh, he was a killer, but sweet. You know? Yeah. He said, the boys get $100 a minute. Not a word goes on paper without $100 down. Oh and my God. people would say, well, wait a minute. We didn't see it. They said, you're dealing with professionals here. <laughs> <laughs> he later got moved to California and he got put in charge of the Steve Allen show. Which yeah. Was moving out there. And Sam and I got a job on the Steve Allen show. Wow. With, along with Buck Henry, who also was his first television job. When you when you were talking before about the comedians that you had written for, that you said nobody would know who they were, how did you go about finding comedians to write for back then? Did you go into the clubs and then approach them like, hey, we can well, punch up your act? Like, uh, oh, God, not, now I'm forgetting his name. Damn it. He was in high school when he somehow heard about it. He, he was on Barney Miller, the little... Ron, uh, uh, he was the okay. little cop on Barney Miller. Anyway, we, we, we wrote for him. You can find it. Yeah. Because he was brilliant. And he was in high school. Ron, Ron Carey? Ronnie, Ronnie Carey, yes. Okay. Yeah. And he, he, I don't know how he heard about us, but we wrote for him. Wow. He was a very sweet kid. And he started to get jobs. He came from New Jersey, a very close Italian family. And he was terrified when he got a job that was outside of 
listening to WNEW on his car radio. Okay. Because he figured if he could hear WNEW, then it was like being with us. <laughs> security. So he would go like Pennsylvania and he'd go into a mountain. It would go off for a couple of minutes, then it would come back. But wow. we wrote for him. And then the, the big thing that happened is we 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 got a job writing for a, a team called Taylor and Mitchell, and they were represented by Joe Scandori, hmm. who was Don Rickles' manager. Oh, my God. Okay. Yeah, and he also owned or ran the Eleganti Club in Brooklyn, hmm. which was the off-Broadway version of the Copa. And oh, wow. It wow. it had uh, it it had a uh, special program during the week, twenty five dollars a person for <laughs> dinner, wine, and a show and dancing. Oh my god! And he would sell it to various groups, and you'd have groups like the Ku Klux Klan sitting next to the NAACP. So <laughs> Holy the shit. groups were the most diverse people and they came in hating each other and hating him and so he had these comics and we wrote for them wow and the first thing we wrote was it was the day that the first astronaut was launched oh wow and so we had written this piece about being an astronaut and being uh, seeing people look look like the whole thing the only thing was that nobody in the audience knew what an astronaut was. So we were <laughs> doing all these brilliant. And we later, Billy, Billy Dana did it later in, in Jose the Astronaut. He used mm -hmm. that piece. But that night it died. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I always say that if you called at that time, if you called any nightclub in the country and said, is Rocco there? There would be two answers, just a minute or speaking. <laughs> you know, not there with which one? Yeah, yeah. So you, you got a club with two Roccos, you know you're in trouble. Right. But they eventually caught on, and he, and he was really a terrific supporter of ours. And then we ended up, through him, writing a piece for Dick Sean, who was a major star at the time. Wow, yeah. And that kind of gave us uh, a presence that people started to know about us. And, oh, and, wow. And they, the big deal was to write for uh, 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 Alan and Rossi. They were almost, almost Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis. Oh, wow. And they, you, if you heard, you, you well, at Marty yeah. Allen is still around, or mm -hmm. was, and uh, they were at the Copa, and we got invited by them to come with the possibility of writing for them, which would have been a a really big deal at the time, and we went to the Copa, and I hated them. Really, I couldn't stand there. I what mean, was it? it was just like their act was. It was awful. I mean, oh. people loved it. I couldn't stay. <laughs> now, now was it their could, delivery or the material? It was just everything about them that I didn't <laughs> like. And this was going to be a big break for us, you know? Right. And it's George. I said, George, he, I can't. He said, let me handle it. Just don't blow it. Mm -hmm. So they came off walking through the crowd with their shirts open and their bow ties open and people slapping them on the back. And they were just so full of themselves. Mm -hmm. And I figured, geez, I have to say something here. What <laughs> do I say? And when they got there, they took up to our table. He said, huh? Huh? And I said, God, do you do 45 minutes? And they said, <laughs> yeah. And all I did was tell them how long they were on. And they, <laughs> they filled in the rest. Oh, wow. We didn't That's end hilarious. Up writing for them. Oh man, was it so? When you were writing for comics stuff like that, did you guys have a, a like a goal in mind? Were you like, okay, we're going to do this for a little bit, and then we're going to oh, make yeah, our way to television? Everybody was was that. That's the way you got started. Okay. You know? First of all, there wasn't really that much television. It was in the early fifties, mm -hmm. and you know, uh, you used to watch television in the window of an appliance store. There'd be thirty-five sets all on the same channel, right? And they'd have a speaker, 
And if you didn't like the show, you had to change the store, you know. <laughs> so writing for comics was the way. And the funny thing is when when George was pitching us for the Steve Allen show, we had a we had a package of 10 pounds mm-hmm. of written material. It was like that. Wow. And they said, well, Steve wants to see some. So we packed up this thing mm-hmm. and we sent it to him. And we heard, well, Steve left before it got there. So he sent it to Charlie Sonzo, who's going to be the producer. And then we waited to hear. And he said, well, Charlie didn't get a chance to watch it. So he sent it to Steve in Las Vegas. Well, Steve left Las Vegas early and he sent it. to. It went around <laughs> to everybody wow we got the job and on the day that i was walking down the steps from my apartment in new york to go to california a parcel post guy came up with this package Mm -hmm. covered in stamps it was the 10 pounds of material which (laughs) no one had ever opened and had been probably a thousand dollars worth of posted <laughs> it proved that it, it didn't matter what the 10 pounds of material was as long as you could say i got 10 pounds of material i got wow. us. yeah how did you hear about um you know carl reiner dick van dyke show that type of thing like what was the what was the thing that got you into the door well at that time we got to LA in in sixty in sixty, mm-hmm. yeah. And so we did Steve, and then that got canceled. And uh, I actually we wrote one joke that saved our whole career oh, on that well, show because we were hired for three weeks mm-hmm. with a three yeah. week pickup with a three week pickup with a three. So we were always going to be on the guillotine. Mm. And we were getting five hundred dollars a week a piece, mm-hmm. and I was making seventy five dollars at W E W. Wow! And we figured we're never going to get a guarantee any better, and we either have to take the shot or not. So we had to quit. Mm-hmm. My wife was pregnant, and wow. uh, it couldn't have been more pressure. Yeah. And uh, on the third week, we wrote one joke that. Steve Allen loved so much. He just laughed and laughed and laughed. And he picked us up for the whole 26 weeks. <laughs> and three weeks later, the show was canceled, but he had to pay us. Oh, so suddenly man. we had $15,000 piece, which allowed a lot of money then. Yeah. And allowed us to stay there. And uh, what was the joke? Do you remember? Oh, uh, God, do I remember? Uh, <laughs> I actually have, I, I I won't take a chance of screwing things up, but there was a show on at the time, it was the first of the medical shows, it was called Ben Casey. Mm-hmm. And it was, it, it had this young kind of sexy actors, Ben Casey, and the old head of the hospital, Dr. Zorba, was played by... Uh, I'm 90. I lose names for a second. That's a common theme here. So Yeah. uh, (laughs) But he was a great old uh, uh, Yiddish theater actor. And he he had hair up to there. And he actually played Gunga Din in the movie, which is so strange. Oh, wow. Sam Jaffe, that was his Oh, okay. So anyway, the opening of the show, there would be a blackboard. And Dr. Zorba, you know, medical jacket with a pointer and his hair sticking out Mm -hmm. and he would say this is the sign for man this is the sign for woman this is bite this is death and this is infinity and that was the opening of the show (laughs) so what we did joey foreman who was a great mimic Mm -hmm. god you know these names mean nothing to people but Anyway, he he played Dr. Zorba and he had hair that was even crazier than thing. Mm. And uh, he this is a joke. 
this is the sign for man. These are chalk figures. Mm -hmm. This is the sign for man. This is the sign for woman. This is birth. This is death. This is infinity. And this is a pussycat. And there was a little <laughs> chalk drawing. And Steve Mount thought that was a funny thing. And I actually have somebody sent me a picture of that frame. Oh, wow. Which I will screw up this whole thing trying to get. Oh, if you get it later, we'll we'll put it in post. Okay. It, yeah. It, it, it was, it, it, it really, Steve, Steve laughed. He just loved it. Oh, that's great. And so that allowed us to stay in California. It also allowed me to loan $5,000 to one of my closest friends at the time who happened yeah. to get a job on the Bob Newhart show at the same time that we got our job and he got fired and he was going to have to leave and come back to New York. He was wow. a copywriter, but he, he was writing at night and stuff like mm -hmm. we all did. We'd work and do our writing at night, have been right. at Horn and Hard Arts and mm -hmm. then go to work. And his name's Ernie Chambers. And he went on to become the producer of the Smothers Brothers. Right. And uh, his he would have never been able to stay had it not been for that joke. Oh, my God. That is beautiful, man. I love that a joke did all that. It's um, funny that that things come down to a given moment. You know, yeah. say, what was the turning point? And that was it. Right. Without that joke, I'm not here. Yeah. Television would be invented and you'd be talking to someone else. <laughs> I don't know what would have happened because, right. I mean, after that, Steve went off. We, we got a job uh, on the Andy Williams show oh, and wow. we got caught in a battle between two old time killer writers hmm. who are legendary, but won't the names won't mean anything to you. No, it's said them anyway. It's good. Uh, Harry Crane was one of them. Okay. Harry Crane was the funniest person on the face here. He wrote for Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis and he traveled with them. And wow. he was uh he was a hilariously vicious person. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he was the kind of guy who you'd be at a run through of a sh of a show and uh something would get a great laugh. And he said, I told you so, right? <laughs> so, so they'd hear. And then if something wouldn't get a laugh and he'd say, you didn't listen. <laughs> <laughs> he would just, and the reading of the first Andy Williams show, which Sam and I had written about 90% of the show, all the sketches and stuff. And at the reading, when the network people were there and, and and it was a you know big crowd of people and we had heard about harry and to watch ourselves because he mm -hmm. was treacherous but about on page two there was a huge laugh and harry said the boys wrote that oh wow and we said to ourselves see you can try and then he never said it again <laughs> <laughs> we had written most of it Everything that came next. Right. He just indicated that was the one joke we had written. <laughs> <laughs> so at any rate, we ended up getting fired from that. It was just awful. Oh, man. And uh, it would, came at a bad time. The baby had just been born. I had a rented car wow. that I was going to have to turn in. And... It happened to coincide. We were going to visit two comics to see if we could write for them. And they were uh, uh, performing at the Covina Bowling Alley. Oh, wow. Which shows you what headliners they were. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I probably would have done the same room. Down, it was just the worst experience. <laughs> and uh, it was raining. It had to rain on top of it. Mm -hmm. And we go and we meet these guys at the COVID and we go to listen to them. And every punchline, someone would have a strike and everybody be screaming. So we never <laughs> even heard the punchline. <laughs> and the, the pen pins were falling off. It was awful. Oh and we God. sat and commiserated with them. 
Mm. And that was Rowan and Martin. Oh, wow. my God. Yeah. I mean, wow. It, it, the reason I, I tell this story is that a year later, they were the biggest things in the world. And that night in the Covina bowling alley, they couldn't <laughs> pay for the drinks, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, and that's that's how it is. It comes from nowhere. So at any rate, we wanted to write situation comedy because that was variety was fun, but it was kind of going out of style. Had you attempted to perform your own material at any point? I did. It, I did a little bit, you know, but mm -hmm. not, not, not really. Uh, I perform it to sell it, you know, I do sure. a piece or whatever. And uh, anyway, the, the, the biggest thing in the world was the Van Dyke show. Wow. The first year it wasn't a success because it was put in a very bad time slot and uh, they were going to cancel it. And Sheldon Leonard, who was one of the, and you know him from yep. movies, the talk through the side of his mouth. He yep. was, he was yeah. you know. And Danny Thomas was also one of the partners that did the Van Dyke show, their mm -hmm. production company. They had a production company. We were on a studio that had five stages. We had the Danny Thomas show, the Dick Van Dyke show, the Andy Griffith show, Gomer Pyle and I Spy. Wow. We had five of the top 10 shows on television at one point. That's incredible. On that little on that little lot. At any rate, uh, so the, the Van Dyke show was like everybody in those days. You you wrote a sample script. Mm -hmm. You can't do that today. They they you know that that's not a possibility because illegal. Everybody makes a big deal, and right. it has to be submitted by an agent. But then everybody was writing sample scripts. Mm -hmm. So. The same, we also got an assignment on McHale's Navy because Tim Conway was on the Steve Allen show. That was his first television show. So we had written stuff for him and mm -hmm. he got us an assignment on McHale's Navy. Uh, and we had written this sample script and Carl read it and he said, your story is stupid, but I like your writing. Come in and have a meeting. And... We'll see what you can do. Wow. So the the whole concept of the Van Dyke, sh Van Dyke show and why it survives to this day is everything that happened on that show happened to somebody involved in the show. Right. I mean, they would come in and say, anything happened? Yeah, this, so and so. And, and, and that's where the shows were. So they were created from reality. Yeah. And the other thing, Carl, he would not allow any jargon, any, you know, hey, that's hip. Or the, he said, someday in the future, that's going to seem old mm -hmm. and that'll hurt us. Yeah. So that's why the show is as fresh as it is. You know, the only thing missing is there's no cell phones and, you know, half the shows on television back then. Yeah, would have been off in three minutes if there had been cell phone. Oh my God, the boss is coming! I'll call and tell. No, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it would be a, it, Romeo and Juliet would have yeah. ended differently if, <laughs> if the cell phone you know, <laughs> would have been finished. And uh, so the show just had a freshness, and what it dealt with was human behavior, which mm -hmm. really never changes. You know, I always said the only thing that changes is the wardrobe you know yeah the, the same a guy slipping on a banana peel building the pyramids people laughed mm -hmm. and a guy walking out of a wall street firm slipping on a banana peel i mean funny is funny yeah and, and it, it it just doesn't change right so at any rate I told Carl when we went in to talk about a story, I said, well, he said, I want something that's real. And so I said, well, when my baby was born, I wasn't sure we got the right kid because they kept, there was another family with a similar sounding name 
and we got their candy and we got my wife got her dinner one night and so <laughs> so I said so I wasn't I was afraid we didn't get the right yeah. baby and right then there was no DNA mm -hmm. so how do you tell right and uh the only way that you could tell is if the baby was of a different ethnicity and the normal approach would have been an asian child mm -hmm. because there would be no you know no racial barriers to that thing sure. but Carl said because it was right at the beginning of the civil rights movement he said no they're going to be a black couple nice and uh we said fine and we wrote the script and everything and, and of course cbs when they saw it they, they had a big meeting and they said well you can't do this and carl said why he said well i i know you're familiar with the show and yeah yeah at the very end when he's convinced that he's forced the other couple to come over because they had his figs and his chocolates and he said you can bring the figs and the baby and we'll give you your candy and your baby and so he had set up this absurd situation for himself and uh he opens the door and in comes an african-american couple mm -hmm. and cbs so you see you can't do that and carl said why he said well i know that there's a lot going on and, and things are changing but you can't have a white couple make fun of an African-American couple. And Carl said, no, no, that's not it. It's the African-American couple that are making fun of the white mm -hmm. couple. And the guy said, oh, my God, you certainly can't do that. <laughs> so Carl said, well, we're going to do it or I'm not going to. And he made a whole big thing out of it and said he wouldn't do the show. So they let wow. us do it. And I remember when the door opened and they came in there was a deadly silence mm -hmm. carl was standing next to me and he said oh shit!" <laughs> <laughs> and then what started was the longest continuous laugh i mean there may have been some after but i think it still holds the record continue the show i mean every time we'd start it again and go a step further or a line further they'd find that hysterical and it, it took us 25 minutes to do the last two minutes of the show wow. you know wow. but at any rate when we handed that show in we also had handed in uh our mikhail's navy and we went in for a note session at, at universal and it was a 35 page script and there were notes on every we stopped on every single line wow and we stopped for lunch and sam and i sat there and said well this is it we can't do this i mean this is we're obviously not good enough for this and then we went back and we finished another three hours with this script and we were broken and we came back to our office and we had an office that wasn't big enough for both of us so i sat in the hall people walk by and hear me talking to something and uh we sat down defeated and and the phone rang and it was carl and sam said yeah whoa real i said what 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 he said he loves the show and we can do as many van dykes as we can and we wants us to come be part of the show and learn wow so in the course of the same day we were destroyed by one guy mm -hmm. and given a career by a second one and that really was the turning point of, of our lives to you know when when you did the van dyke show i would be at a party and i just sit there and wait till somebody asked what i did oh and when I said I did the Van Dyke show, it was like that old E.F. Hutton commercial where everything stopped. And then the rest <laughs> of the evening, it was all about, what about where Mary, did she, you know what I mean? It was yeah. It was that popular. Wow. And I and remember I, the, the first year, 
uh, Mel Brooks and Buck Henry did uh, Get Smart. Mm -hmm. And we were up for an Emmy. And Get Smart was up for an Emmy. And we won. <laughs> and <laughs> Mel Brooks got up and yelled, there is no God. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, the show was just, oh, and the great fun of it was that the guy who fired us on the Andy Williams show, Andy got, got picked up to do eight shows. Mm -hmm. And after the first show, Andy said, call Phil and Sam, see if they'll come back. So oh my God. I knew we weren't coming back, but I made this guy. What dates was that? Is that? <laughs> let me say it's a Monday, right? And that'll be Thursday. So the, the, and I drove him crazy knowing that we would never. Oh, that's beautiful. Do it. That's hilarious. I have to read out. This is so I know these are the episodes uh, that I'm pretty sure. I know you've written on these. I don't know if there's any other ones that you wrote completely. Coast to Coast Big Mouth. Yes. Uh, 100 Terrible Hours. Yes. Uh, Bubkiss. Right. The Redcoats Are Coming. Yes. One of my all-time favorites, by the way, The Redcoats Are Coming. We had yes. Jeremy Clyde on um, like six months ago. Oh, really? Loved talking to Jeremy about the... He had great things to say about his experience uh, with that episode on yeah. the Dick Van Dyke Show. Apparently, Don Rickles had stopped by during that episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and they had never met him before. They were just, they were like, we were just two British kids. And we had never... Yeah. No, you know, that, was, that was an incredible show. So funny. Um, and what else? The Impractical Joke, another great one. Three Letters from One Wife. That we didn't do. You didn't do that one? No, but we wrote on all of them. I mean, we okay. were the story editors. Okay. So the, the truth about it is that you, wrote, you used outside writers because you couldn't possibly do all of it yourself. Right. And you did a lot of rewriting and okay. you uh, usually gave them a story in many instances. I mean, there were some guys who were great and came in mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, did the job. But I mean, some guy won a Writers Guild Award for a show that he didn't have two words in except his his name, you know. And wow. I remember another show and we always invited the writers. And the guy said afterwards. I got to be honest, I didn't think there was that much to it when I handed it in. Well, there wasn't. I mean, the other <laughs> yeah, thing. Yeah, not that is, you got to it. Aside from the, 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 the fixing it when it came in, after rehearsals, you would spend hours going over stuff that didn't work. And then you do that twice a week at right. two run throughs. So you changed a lot of stuff, which wasn't necessarily a fault of the writers. It was that once you saw something, mm -hmm. it was different. And you said, yeah. you know what we could do here? And in fact, when I became a director, I became a director as a writer. Instead mm -hmm. of writing with words, now I had people. Yeah. And suddenly somebody yeah. would be standing and I said, oh my God, you're over there. Why don't we do, you know? Yeah. So the nature of, the t multiple camera shows like the Van Dyke show mm -hmm. was that they were really rewritten a lot. And in later years, they were rewritten too much. Right. Well, how collaborative was the Van Dyke show in terms of the writing? Cause you had, you had Maury Amsterdam who was, you know, known as the human joke machine. Yeah. Well, the thing is Maury's jokes were not usually in the style or in the, the arena of the humor on the Van Dyke show. In fact, when Maury would do the warm up with the audience, the show wouldn't play well because Maury was doing one liners and the Van Dyke show was not, was no oh, one liners. We never wrote a joke. We wrote situations happen and turned and the humor came, uh, came out of that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, a lot of that was situational, and it, and it had yeah, to be. Oh, it was all, you know. And yeah. To me, one of the funniest lines in the show about the wrong baby was when Dick goes to the door and Mary grabs the cradle with the baby and says, you are not taking my baby. Mm -hmm. And he <laughs> says, Laura, 
I think it would be best if you went, went to your room. <laughs> and you see, that was so funny. Yeah. But, and it wasn't a joke. It was just a guy behaving like a schmuck. Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah exactly. And the thing, yeah. That, the thing that made the Van Dyke show special and made a difference was it was the first time that a husband and wife were mutually afraid of one another. Yeah. In other words, usually it was the wife, oh, my God, what is he going to do about that? And on the Van Dyke show, he would say, oh, Laura's going to kill me. Well, it was the first time. And then that was because Carl's relationship with his wife was that kind of a relationship. Mm -hmm. He really was concerned about what Estelle felt and thought. And yeah. so that's what the show had in it. How, how much of the so the other episodes um i have are the ghost of a chance did you write yeah. that one yeah one that to this day since i was a kid because when i was a kid it used to scare me a little bit yeah yeah And because i you know I, but i got the humor in it when i was younger too still one of the funniest episodes of a tv show ever is that well, my that comes favorite from thing was when the, bed, when the folding bed <laughs> closed on them and almost stayed yeah. oh my god that is so and the and when he returns back to it and he goes i just yeah. want to get one thing straight before we go any further this couch was open and then he jumps <laughs> up off yeah. of it yeah. that is hilarious yeah. and the other yeah. the other line too buddy uh when buddy's in bed with him and he goes uh, will you turn the light off and he just goes are you kidding is just perfectly just hilarious the, yeah it was the fear. that's not jokes that's just right that's just people being, and you know, Dick was so inventive. I mean, you would write him into situations that you couldn't anticipate everything he would do, mm -hmm. but he would find something. Yeah. I mean, it was a show that Carl wrote uh, where Mary got her toe caught in the in the bathtub. That romantic, oh, yes. that romantic, one romantic evening, and. Uh, so Dick, she locked the door for whatever reason, and her toe was caught, and, and Dick is going to break the door down. So he he ran across the room and hit it with his left shoulder mm -hmm. and fell in pain. And then she said, you've got to get me out of here. So he started again, and he ran at the door with his left shoulder, and in midair, he switched to his right shoulder. <laughs> no one wrote that. Wow. That was just him. Yeah. And then in the hundred terrible hours where he's up to break the record of being on the air and he's really groggy and he's having a cup of coffee and he puts it down on a, on a the record on the turntable. So now the coffee cup is going around and he's talking to this lady on the phone about mm -hmm. a lost cat. Mm -hmm. He keeps <laughs> reaching yep. and just, it was, it's brilliant. I mean, yeah. just, and then there was the show where the naked painting of Laura. Oh my God. Yeah. And when he's, she's talking to him about it and he's leaning over the stove in the count in the, you know, cooking counter mm -hmm. and he's just leaning over to the, the stove and he's saying, honey, he's on, you know, it's going to be all right. And she's mm -hmm. about that. He said, listen, that's what husbands are here for. Um, behind you and don't worry about a thing and she's oh you're so wonderful and he said no oh, that's what i'm here for and when she leaves and he gets up the hand the, the hey. grates of the oh <laughs> yeah like that. that that was dick oh that's brilliant he just he just you would sit in wonder of what he would do wow would that was that nice as a writer to have a a, a oh, team God. like actors to work God, with? Yes. That were, yeah, yeah. And the writing on the Van Dyke show was Carl and Sam and myself. And mm -hmm. if we had an outside writer, they'd give the script, but they wouldn't be there for the rewrites and they wouldn't be oh. there for the run throughs. And we would have a run through on Friday night, mm -hmm. and we'd sit around with peanuts or whatever, and all of us, Maury and Dick and Mary, it was kind of a social thing. And we'd go through the script and, and, and fix things. And uh, then on Monday night, we do it again, mm -hmm. a shorter version. And then Tuesday, we would shoot the show. Wow. And uh, 
what became the thing in in Hollywood and in those multiple camera shows is the writer's room, which is legendary. And Mm -hmm. every show had a writer's room. And that meant that those run throughs would then go and there, there was, there would be about eight writers on the show staff. And so they would do the writing of the shows for the most part. But then when it was the rewrite time, they would go in to the writer's room and they would have a secretary there and they would go through the whole script. Mm. And they had the menus of all the best restaurants in L.A. And they would call up and order $2,000 worth of food. (laughs) And some of the guys didn't want to go home anyway. So they would sit for six hours in the writer's room. Wow. And laugh and break each other up. And we never did that, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. and what happened is, I, I said, at a certain point, you're not making the show better. You're just making it different. There's a point where you have to say, you know what? We've had plenty of time to get the right and give the actors a chance to feel comfortable with, with, with what they have to do. Mm-hmm. The, the ensemble and that cast and everything and getting everybody together. I don't see a lot of bloopers from those days. I don't know if it's just because of the timing, but what was it like? We, did we, nobody break we up? Had, yeah, we had some. We had a gag reel. But you did? It, yeah. But they were such pros, man. Yeah, I was going to say, because some of those, I mean, I, I can't imagine getting through some of those episodes, especially Coast to Coast Big Mouth. I mean, the just the... The large scale, everything uh, Carl Reiner was doing, screaming into the you know phone when he picks it up, you know that not- scene is considered still in the list of ten funniest scenes. Uh, you know, considering I don't know what the latest version of that list is, but it is a brilliant. It is, and it was written to cater to Mary mm-hmm. and what she could do and what yeah. Carl did. And well, what was the impetus to get Carl to do it? Because up until that point, they weren't sure he was going to play um, Alan Brady, right? Because we never saw him until that point, right? No, oh no, he was Alan Brady a lot. He was Alan Brady, but we never saw his face, right? That Wasn't that the first time we saw his face? No, no, no. No? He, oh, okay. Wait a minute. No, we, he, he was on. He was, yeah, now he was got on. me questioning myself. <laughs> no, but he, I know this is so, it's one of those things I nerd out about all the time. Yeah, there, right? are a couple of, there were a couple of shows that. Yeah, were, where he was the voice and then you saw the back of his head. And, and uh, but no, he was in a lot of the shows. You're wrong that time. Okay. Let's, let's watch them all and fuck. Yeah, let's do it. Don't tempt, <laughs> don't tempt me. We'll go long. I don't care. <laughs> you know, it's, the, the thing about Carl they decided at CBS around Christmas time that they were going to rerun some colorized versions of the Van Dyke show. Oh, yeah. And two Van Dykes and two I Love Lucy's as a mm-hmm. kind of a holiday treat. And Carl got to select what shows they would do. And the shows he picked were Coast to Coast Big Mouth and The Wrong Baby. Oh, wow. And then the next year, he picked two more shows that we had written. Instead of himself, you know, he he oh well, he was he was in uh, uh, October Eve, the you know the naked picture show. Yeah. Oh yeah, he was the painter. Carpetna, yeah. Yeah. But he he was so generous, you know. And Carl wrote the first thirteen shows all by himself. That was part yeah. of why. Sheldon Leonard and Danny Thomas wanted to do this. Nobody had 13 scripts. Scripts were so hard to come by, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who um, who did the, uh, when you did the Alan Brady Show Presents, who came up with the the dance sequence at the, you know, that, that, um, fine when musician. They, bum, 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 bum. Yeah, when they do that thing like yeah. all in a row and rhythmically, because you yeah, did it, you did it twice. Remember, they, I don't remember who that was. Wasn't me. Wasn't was that like a standard back then? Was that something that they created on the spot, or because that's the only time I've ever that. seen it? Yeah, they created that. I think it may have been Earl Hagen. Wow, the musical director. That was the brilliant. other thing that many people don't realize is that Don Rickles 
his real big breakthrough was the Van As Dyke the burglar. who did. I mean, people really became aware of him. Lyle Delp. Yep. Yeah. The guy who robs them in the elevator. In the elevator with a car. Yeah. Um, and they help him get away. Who was the um, inspiration for Big Max Calvada? Just trying to use Sheldon. Wasn't it? Wasn't after any specific mob? No, at the time? it was just doing a show with okay. a mafia kind of guy and and having Sheldon play it. Okay. And Calvada was the name of the production shop company. Oh, I didn't even Carl, put that together. Carl Van Dyke. Danny and and uh, oh was, my god yeah that, that's what Calvada the end of every show is a Calvada production I didn't even put that together I feel like a yeah. moron yeah no wow that is amazing um is there any particular episode that you feel like more than anything else withstands the test of time that it would work in any any situation comedy today hmm I don't know. Uh, I think the October Eve would, mm -hmm. you know, the naked painting would. Yeah. Uh, I think I think coast to coast big mouth would work. Uh, you know, a boss and and the wife of, of a guy would work. Mm -hmm. But today stuff is so dirty and you know everything has to be vulgar right. and, and and uh i mean we never did anything well first of all you couldn't but it right was, right you know, it <laughs> separate was, beds but once you could start doing that stuff and then and everybody was doing it and everything was just prurient you know right i mean i the show that i never i really resented was girls I, I did not like that show either and the re uh, one of the reasons was that they compared it to that girl oh, they yeah. called lena dunham that girl and i no. said no she is not that girl no we no and i wrote a piece about it and uh i just resented the vulgarity of it mm -hmm. and i didn't know any girls like that you know right. And I have daughters and, 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 uh, you know, and I railed against it so much. That I was doing it during a, an interview like this. And somebody said, well, if, if you were in charge of girls, what's the first thing you would do? And I said, the laundry. <laughs> I said that bed, you could plant crops in. <laughs> you know, that is going on there. Yeah. Yeah, there there wasn't one likable character on that show. That was the well, thing that was a lot of stuff today. A lot of the dramas, in particular, there is nobody to like. Right. You have to pick the least awful person, like on, on Succession. Yes. Like oh Henry my god. Dude for for that nebbish son, you know, because yeah. he's so beaten up. But he's a terrible disaster. A you terrible know? person. You're all awful. Yeah, absolutely. No, I know what you mean. Uh, it's it's kind of weird now. I mean, that's why the Dick Van Dyke show, I think, holds up so well no matter what, because you can always you, you like humanity. all the characters. There's, yeah, there's humanity. There's there's, de there's decency relationships, human interaction. Yeah, they care about each other. How how closely related? Like what were the, were the writers room situations in that? You know, the banter back and forth. How much that went on in your writers room? Did you no, put that into was theirs? that was that was the tone of that was from Carl's background in the caesar show caesar show yeah your show shows yeah i mean okay. they had a female writer stell diamond mm -hmm. and uh, not a stell diamond what was her name? anyway mm. they had a woman so he had a woman and they had a joke guys <clears throat> but that was all from carl's caesar period was there anybody in particular that you you would have maybe liked to see on the show at that time and didn't get on? Not, not nothing I can think. So you guys of. had great guest stars too. Yeah, and people wanted to do the show. Yeah, it was a badge of uh, of honor to have a Van Dyke. It was just amazing. I mean, there were other great shows, and God knows Norman Lear broke all kinds of ground. 
but there was a certain majesty about the Van Dyke show. It was clean, mm -hmm. pure, brilliantly funny. Yeah. Brilliantly funny people. One of my other favorite episodes is Oni Umps. Oh, yeah. That was uh, Gary Marshall and, and uh, Jerry Belson. No, oh, that was Dale Craven and and uh, who was his partner? Klein Schmidt and McCraven. That was. Oh, who was Gary? Who did, which one did Gary Marshall write? I just saw. Oh him with God, him. are you kidding? Gary and Jerry uh, wrote and wrote of them a bunch of them. Oh, one of the ones they wrote was uh, the when he thought he had the Liberty Bell on his. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and That's we a have one. the chain reaction of where <laughs> he destroyed everybody else's. So you know, well, what was the name of the? magazine strange but true or something. Oh, strange but true yeah yeah yeah. yeah. He, the duck that hadn't eaten in, in oh in 10 years ate the potato that was shaped like yeah mickey my god it was awful um you were saying something backstage about carl reiner and the impression that he left on you like you said there's a little bit of carl in you yes. what was it that, that you think he he kind of passed on to you i think it was honesty Hmm. And uh, it, it, it just honesty and decency. And he was very courageous, Carl. I mean, you know, he would take on anybody. I mean, there, there was a guy who was the new guy at CBS taking over programming. He came to L.A., to lay the law down to all the shows mm -hmm. and everybody was saying, Oh man, he is a bitch. This guy is just <laughs> terrible. And so he finally came to the Van Dyke show and it was Carl and Sam and myself in the room. And the guy came in with three other guys and uh, he had his coat over his shoulders mm -hmm. rather than wearing it. And I said, Oh, this is not going to go well. Cause I know. <laughs> <laughs> and then, he sat down and he put his feet up on the coffee table. Mm -hmm. I said, this is going to really be a disaster. And then he started pontificating and he said, I'm going to tell you now how I view comedy and what I think is funny. Mm -hmm. And he started to talk very quietly, almost like he was going over to get closer to him for this wisdom. Carl went over and he came over and he took the guy's Gucci loafer off and threw it out the window. <laughs> oh, and my said, God. That's funny. <laughs> the guy never said another word. Wow. I mean, and then. That's balls. Huh? That's, that's guts. Yeah. I mean, it was just, he would not stand. He would not stand for pretension or, or posing or and nothing like that. Wow. There was another time there was this writer who very natty guy. Mm -hmm. And if the if the fashion changed that morning, he would go to Side Devour, which was the clothes store, and he would have it. <laughs> Even if it in the morning he wore one thing and he heard something at lunch, he'd go get it. And wow. He had he was bald and he had about four strands of hair that were six feet long mm -hmm. and he <laughs> laced them across his head like right and i said it was like a zither you could you could play it. <laughs> and he came to have a meeting with carl and carl was staring at him he said marm don't say anything you're a very talented man but you're bald you're not fooling anybody he went over and he picked up the strands of hair and he walked across stood there six feet away Oh. He says, Marvin, you got to face it, you're bald. Then he goes, <laughs> he said, get rid of it. Wow. And he, he could do that, and, and you wouldn't be insulted because he was right. Wow. And he was oh, doing man. it in a nice way. He also loved to give haircuts. <laughs> <laughs> I, to a party. I didn't know that. He's looking at you. He said, you really... The shape, come with me. And you go to the bathroom and get scissors and you give you a haircut. Were they good? Wow. Yeah, they were good. Everything wow. he did was good. Now I'm a little afraid. Do you think he'd, he would probably give me a haircut? Oh, you'd, you'd be out of here, man. <laughs> <laughs>
the other the other episode I love too, which I think is probably again, there's so many favorite episodes that I have. The one, uh, the auction. I have to know, did that happen to one of you? Which one? The painting? The auction. The one where they're at the auction and they accidentally bid on the uh, on an item. It was the painting. The uh, the yeah. They get the the Artanis painting. The Artanis painting. Yeah. Yeah. It turned out to be a Sinatra. A Sinatra. Yeah. Yeah. Did that happen to somebody? Yeah. Oh my God. What? Yeah. That 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 whole sequence of events is so perfectly timed out. I mean, it's you can't not laugh at that. Well, one of my favorites, and it, it because it happened to me, was when he the, the case of the pillows, the uh, pillows that smelled like ducks. Yeah. He went to small claims court. <laughs> that was on the other he, night. To play Clarence Darrow. Yeah, that happened yeah. to me actually when I first got married. Guy came <laughs> around the apartment building selling pillows, good price. Hey, great. Go to sleep. What is this? Some it's ducks. It smells like ducks. Guy came by another time. I stopped. I said, you know, we got to smell like ducks. He said, no, I don't think I'm mean, well, my wife. He said, well, wait a minute. He went down. He got his wife. She smelled the pillows mm -hmm. and said, uh, no, not like ducks. And we had just moved in. And so I went next door and I knocked on the door. I said, hi, where are your new neighbors? And they said, oh, how nice. I said, mm -hmm. Come on in. They said, great. And I grabbed the pillow. I said, smell that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that was that was where that show came from. Oh, my God. And, of course, you give Dick a chance to be a schmuck lawyer and he'll he'll eat it up, you know. Yeah. yeah. And the he, 30 different ways he sneezes. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. And he, the way he plays a drunk and. Yeah. I mean, just everything. Right. Did you guys stay close over the years, after, even after uh, the show ended? Somewhat. Dick went through a very difficult period. And right. he was drinking a lot. And uh, he kind of... He, he did the other sh show in Arizona where he lived. Mm -hmm. And uh, he drank a lot there. And he was... He, he just wasn't... I was always in touch with him. I was very mm -hmm. close with Mary. We were, were very good friends. Oh, wow. And when she came to New York, I was the only person she really knew. Mm. So we spent a lot of time together. And uh, oh, this is a kind of a special moment. I mean, when when she died, uh, they had a few, her husband, Robert, had a funeral for her in in Connecticut where they lived and uh, then there was another one for her in, in California that Jim Brooks did who had done the, the Mary, Tyler, Mary Moore. Tyler Moore show yeah and that was very lavish but the one in, in New York was just maybe 50 people most of them from the uh, Diabetes Association which she had been so involved with and mm. Bernadette Peters, who was her best friend, was there and she sang a song. It was really a cold, blustery day. And there were a whole stack of roses. There were more flowers than you can possibly conceive in a small place. And Robert said, you know, you know that Mary loved roses and we'd like each of you to just on your way out to put a rose on her coffin. Mm. And as I approached it, I thought, God, I, I really want to say something. I, what, I just can't put the rose there. But what? And when I got there without thinking, I just said, oh, Rob. <laughs> oh, that's really sweet. That was. You know, yeah. She was she was amazing. I, I really she was really a terrific person. I loved her. And I got to tell you she would silence an entire room by walking into it. Wow. I was walking, when she first got here, I was walking, we went down into the, the Bowery, to the art galleries and stuff, and we were walking down the street, and I happened to look back, and everybody, it was like the wake of a speedboat. Everybody <laughs> was just frozen looking mm. at her. Was there a lot of room, uh, you know, truth to the rumors that there was a bit of tension between her? Yes. And oh, really? Rosemary. Rosemary. Yeah. Because Rosemary thought she was going to be the star. Yes, she did. Hmm. 
Well, it seemed logical, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it was it it created so but it was it was never bitter or you know, it's just a little ruffled feathers and Carl would would handle it and then we'd write a show for Rosie where she sang or did something. Yeah, yeah. Um that's good then. That's inc- I mean, I, this is just an amazing cast. Do you feel like it could have gone on longer than the 5 years or do you think it ended perfectly? I think it was a smart thing to do. Yeah. You know, first of all, they were all in such demand for movies and for everything. And right. And there was nothing left to prove. You know, there was nothing left to do. Yeah. Left at the top. Um, Well, listen, I I mean, I just I want to thank you so much for coming on. It's been a little over an hour. Um, I got to ask you the big three questions that we ask every guest. What? Uh, First question is, if you can go back in time and talk to your younger self, what piece of advice would you give yourself that would help you today? Do everything that you start, finish it. Nice. Don't be afraid. Hmm. Was there something that you didn't finish? A lot of things. I I got into a thing where I I would go 20, 30 pages into something, and it was so good hmm. that I didn't think I could continue it that way. So wow. I wanted to leave it. And when I died and they went through my stuff, they'd say, God, he was really on to something here. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I was afraid that I, I couldn't keep up oh my God. the level of what I was doing. And I, I regret that. Wow. Um, I also regret that I was offered a picture starring Burt Lancaster as a director. Oh, my God. And I, I didn't do it. Oh, I didn't do that for two reasons. It was in Dorado, Mexico, Durango, mm. Mexico. And I get sick every time I go to Mexico. Uh The other thing is, I couldn't picture saying to Burt Lancaster, Burt, when you get on the horse, (laughs) 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 you know. That's great. What else would I tell myself? Uh, Geez, let me see. I'd say, don't be afraid to. I was not afraid to fail. I mean, I did stuff and failed, but there were certain things that. I literally thought this is so good. I'm going to screw it up. And I did. Uh, let me see what else. God, that's interesting. I've never, never thought about that. No. Oh. And, um, don't be so concerned about women. Ah, uh, okay. You know, um, don't try to save women. Hmm. That's from understandable my mother and and all of the anxiety and stuff and trying to fix things and I continue that yeah to a degree in my life and uh, God I can't think of anything else. Sorry, I got two more questions for you too. So we got the second question might might help you out a little bit more too is. Second question is what? Oh, I know what it would be. Go for it. It would be spend more time with culture. Hmm. Because I don't know a lot about the theater, and I always feel stupid. (laughs) And I find myself thinking, "Well, what was I doing instead of that?" (laughs) I can't. (laughs) But yeah, I wish I read more. And I wish I had studied more in college and and in school in general. I wish I had taken advantage of that opportunity to learn, to be exposed to stuff. Yeah. So I had that answer. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Some sage advice. Yeah, absolutely. Really, really sage advice. Well, the, the, the thing I told my, tell my kids was if someone will do something for you, they'll do it to you. Ooh, that's a great piece of advice. The other one is don't cut off your thumb to get into an organization or any relationship because when you want to get out, you don't get your thumb back. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that one before, but I like it. And, I actually have a question from the from the crowd because they've been loving you. They're t- saying how inspiring you are and they definitely want to have you back. Oh, okay. It's, somebody had just asked, who inspired you? Carl. Hmm. Carl, I just wanted to be as good as as 
he thought I was and 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 uh, to never let him down. He, he yeah, he 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 was very important. He's a very special man. Yeah. You know, he and Mel Brooks had dinner together every night. Yep. And they would watch a movie. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a beautiful movies, friendship. The mo oh, my God. Mel went to the house for dinner after Carl died. George oh, really? Shapiro would meet him there. Wow. And uh, they would watch movies. And the movies they loved had the line, secure the perimeter. <laughs> they loved that. <laughs> and you better get a good night's sleep. Yeah. He oh, loved the foreign cool. movies. That's because they had secured approval. And one night I called and I said, what are you watching? And he said, I'm ashamed to tell you. And I said, <laughs> what? He said, we're watching America's Got Talent. And Mel Brooks yelled out, no, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, was I used to talk to Carl about once every two weeks. And he was always excited about something he was doing. And one one time he said, oh, I've been working on this place. Let me read you this. And he read me a thing. He said, no, you got to, well, you can't understand. I got to go back to, the, well, you won't understand. He ended up reading me 35 <laughs> pages of a play. He said, oh, I'm sorry. I said, are you kidding? How many people could say, well, I had a good day today. Carl Reiner read 35. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. What's um, the other question? Other question is, uh, what had to end in your life, good or bad, that led you to where you are today? My marriage. Your first marriage? Yeah. Wow. Yes. It, it just, marriage in the 50s was you got out of college, and if you weren't married, within a year and you didn't have a baby within two years, you were brought up on charges. <laughs> by the American <laughs> Civil Liberties. I mean, it was just, and so what happened is a lot of people who didn't know who they were married someone else who didn't know who they were. And, and they, they tried the impossible mathematical equation of having one and one equal one. Right. And it didn't work. Right. And then as she advanced and he advanced, it was now trying to make him incorporate what she was interested in and vice versa. And it just was a very, there were those marriages were preordained to, I mean, it's amazing that some of them survived, you know? Right. Yeah. And I, I feel bad about the fact that I've been married more than once. And, oh. uh, and, uh, I would love to, if, uh, I mean, like, uh, I, uh, Alan, you know Alan Zoe Bell? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love Alan. Alan. I met, I've become friendly with him recently. And also uh, Phil Rosenthal. Oh, my God. He, the best. Yeah, Phil is, um, I, I was just away at a place and it turned out that he was there and we sort of knew <laughs> each other, but we just spent three days together. And nice. he and his wife and their kids. It was what I wish I would have had, you know. It was God knows that he's thirty years younger than I am, or and and uh, so is Alan, or and but they have the thing that I missed, and and, and I would have loved to have had that. Right. I would love to have had. And my kids are great, and they've had experiences that yeah. are phenomenal and stuff. But I would have loved that continuity of of doing it all together yeah did you did you encourage them to follow in your footsteps i mean you guys are close and they all wound up in show business in some way no i never encouraged they just did mm. were you scared for them when they were entering it or did you feel like no i wasn't worried that's good i, I knew they were all really capable mm. and uh, and uh and it was fun having, you know, sharing it all with him. Yeah. And I love that uh, my daughter Liza works on things and cameramen and stuff. I said, God, I love working with your dad. Oh, How is awesome. he, you know? And the thing I am proud of is that there is nobody I have ever worked with who doesn't like me still. I think right. me. And that's an important thing. 
Yeah. Um, last question I have for you is, um, what piece of advice would you give a young writer today? And if this was a genuine dystopia, what would you want to be doing? What would be the one thing you'd want to do before uh, the world ended? I would like to finish a couple of the things I didn't finish, which I'm going to do, by the way. I believe you. You know? Yeah. Uh, my favorite is uh, is uh, when my I had a second marriage that didn't work because I couldn't see having another child when my own original kids were fighting for their lives after the first one. So I said, I, I just don't see having another child. And she just wanted child so much. She said, I'll, I, and all I had a thing was to say, not right now, you know, Yeah. but she left and uh, it was devastating. And because we really cared about each other and I ended my partnership with Sam that week. Wow because I decided I wanted to be a director mm. and I got custody of my oldest daughter that week because her mother didn't want her in the house. So I had a 12 year old troubled child. My wife left. <laughs> and I ended my partnership with no thought of who would hire me as a director. I could have, been, everybody would hire me as a writer, but I wanted to be a director. Right. And so I was stuck. I said in the 70s, there were five reasons why people were depressed and committing suicide. I had six. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, at any rate, uh, she left and took some of the furniture. And I was oh sitting in the apartment, in the house rather, which I sold. Mm. And the guy from the moving company came to take the rest of the stuff to put it in storage. And he said, so where are you going? And I said, to tell you the truth, I may as well go with you because I have no idea where I belong. So I wow. started, wrote a play about a guy who goes into storage with his furniture because he can't <laughs> figure out where he belongs. Oh, my God. How and long did it run? It didn't. I've, oh. <laughs> I, I, actually, I actually had an offer to do it at the Westwood Playhouse. I had a reading. Who's that? I heard no. Um, I had an offer to do it at the Westwood Playhouse after I had a reading at the Long War Theater. And that was another thing I was afraid of to do that. I'm sorry I didn't do that. Oh. But I, I rewrote it or I started to rewrite it. And I said, I, I, I can't keep this being as good as it is. And it was really a great. 30 pages. There's still time. Yeah, I'm going to do it. Yeah, you got to get that, that one. The guy's a lot older now, and he's doing it for a, a whole other reason. A whole different reason. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, it was it was honestly great to get to know you for a little bit and to have hey, you on, man. It was my pleasure talking to you. Yeah, we absolutely have to have you back, man, because lots uh, of luck. Kate and Allie, my, oh, that, yeah, you know, yeah. it was lots Kate of stuff. Kate and Allie to cover. is very special. I mean, of course, that girl. Yeah, that girl. Changed yeah. the face of women's thinking back yeah. at that time. Anyway, great talking to you guys and thank you for making it work on my schedule when I didn't think I could. Absolutely, and, man. No uh, problem at all. Yep. Okay. Great talking to you. Take Peace. care. Take Bye. Care. Dystopia tonight.